The Middle Way of Practice 18th September, 1962 The way to listen to a desana is to focus your attention in the present. Don't send the mind outward, but keep it fixed within. This is for the purpose of truly experiencing the taste of tamma right in your heart. It has been expounded that one may gain five benefits while listening to a desana. The benefits that will bear fruits in the future are additional side benefits. For this reason, there were many Buddhist followers who became enlightened while listening to the Lord Buddha's Tamma discourse. It was because they had all established their minds correctly. They were not concerned with the past or the future, but were only aware of the present, being solely receptive and ready to experience the taste of Tamma that the Lord was expounding at that time. When the Lord Buddha first went forth into homelessness, he did so with an extremely great interest in Tamma. Even prior to that, he had been fascinated and concerned from the moment he successively caught sight of the four Devadutas, signs, i.e., an old man, a sick man, a dead man, and a holy man, to the day of his renunciation. He then strove with diligent effort in his austere practices and paid attention to his task and undertaking from the first day of his going forth to the day of his enlightenment. He never abandoned his pursuit or relented in his exertion. Laziness, discouragement, and weakness could not prevail over his heart as they do over the hearts of other sentient beings. It was likewise with all the Zavakas who went forth following the example of the Lord with interest and the aspiration to be free from Dukkha. When they listened to the words of the Lord's Tamma, they did so with attentiveness, and took them up and practiced them with devotion. They lived, came, or went with mindfulness. Every facet of exertion was truly attended to with reflection and application of the principles of truth. The results and the rewards of their interest and devotion seem to differ from those of our time. This is due to the immense difference in the appreciation of tamma and the intensity of practice. If such is the case, how can the results be the same? The Lord Buddha never relented nor relaxed in the pursuit of his quest from the first day of his endeavor to the day of his enlightenment when he had finally attained to his goal and became the Sasada, great teacher of the world. He then brought the Tamma out to the Buddhist faithful by teaching and exhorting them following the path of Tamma by which he already had experienced the result. Those who had received the Tamma transmitted by the Lord were all joyful and delighted in the essence of Tamma. Having taken it up and applied it to their practice, they had all, in due course of time, gained to the various Tamma attainments and acquired the Tamma eye, like the Lord had before them. From the beginning, the Lord Buddha was the example and ideal of the Buddhist faithful. This can be seen from the way he practiced. He always spent his time living in the forest. Never did he take an interest in others, not even the kingdom which he had left behind and all the people whom he had ruled over and given peace and security. He was no longer concerned about his princely status, but courageously and unflinchingly stood up to the ordeal of his exertion in Tamma. In this respect, no one can surpass the Lord. Every mode of practice that he carried out always transcended the world. His renunciation and going forth into homelessness differed from the way of the world, so when the results bore fruit, they also differed. They were then of two different worlds, as his heart had been transformed into the purified heart of a Buddha. The results of his attainment must therefore stand in contrast to the rest of the world. This was also true in the case of the Savakas, who had gone forth following the Lord Buddha. When they heard the fundamental instruction given by the Lord, they were highly elated, jubilant, and satisfied. The Lord had exhorted them thus, This, in our own words, would mean, Look yonder, there's a mountain, a deep forest. Over there are the mountainsides and canyons. There are the creeks and streams, cliffs, hilltops and mountain slopes. There are waterfronts and rivers by the hillsides. These are places of ease and quietude, free from all forms of entanglement. 
You should all seek this kind of location and strive in these environments. The Tathagata attained Buddhahood within these settings and surroundings. He did not become enlightened through mingling and socializing, nor did he become enlightened through indulgence in mirth and gaiety following the flow of Danha, self-seeking ambitions and obsessions, which influence and drag one away through the power of the Gilesas. The Tathagata, on the contrary, attained to his enlightenment in secluded and solitary places. Those were the locations where he strove in his strenuous exertion. He escaped from every class of people, from his palace and city, so he could remain in such surroundings. The dukkha that the Tathagata went through was the dukkha derived from his exertion in those secluded and remote places. The Tathagata did not become enlightened amidst the grandeur and magnificence of palaces, at crossroads or marketplaces, or in the midst of the crowds and multitudes. The Tathagata attained to his enlightenment in solitude and seclusion, totally retired from the world. He accomplished his objective and arrived at the state of purity of a Buddha in those out-of-the-way places. For this reason, may all of you turn to those places that the Tathagata has described to you. They are in the mountains, hillsides, and caves, under shady trees, in deep forests, in open spaces where the air is light and clear. These places are deserted and quiet, free from confusion and trouble. These places are not wanted by people, so you should seek for such locations and live there, for they are where the Tathagata attained Buddhahood. If you aspire for the state free from Dukkha following the example of the Tathagata, you must go to the places that the Tathagata has pointed out. Then you will definitely one day follow the Tathagata in being rid of lives and existences, the repeated births and deaths that are like a pit of glowing coals. What is explained above was the Buddha's second fundamental instruction. The first instruction stated, Mangsakula Tsiwarang, etc. All of you who have gone forth should seek for discarded materials left in the cemeteries or along the roadsides, and stitch them together to make your lower robe, upper robe, and outer robe, so they may be used to protect your body and maintain your holy life from day to day. This will accord with your asceticism and Spartan existence in following the way of Tamma by subsisting frugally on the four basic requisites of a monk's life – food, shelter, clothing, and medicine. You will be content with little, and satisfied with whatever requisites are available, and not indulge in using them in an excessive or extravagant manner. You may, however, simply accept a gift of robes presented by lay devotees, as it is the way of simplicity and moderation being easily fed and taken care of, and poses no problems and concerns to the faithful supporters. The third instruction was, Brindiya lo papozanang, etc. Having gone forth in Asasana, way of Buddhism, you must not be lazy. You should go on Bindabada, alms round, feeding yourself by your own effort using your own two feet with a pure and honest heart. All the faithful supporters and lay devotees happily and willingly offer the gift of food following the Samarna, holy man, or recluse tradition, without involving the usual transaction of money in the way that people generally do. The practice and observance of going on Bhandabada as the means of feeding yourself is the pure and impeccable livelihood for one who has gone forth. You should try to maintain this practice for the rest of your life. You should consider any abundance and excess which might occasionally occur as an exceptional circumstance when you have to oblige the laity. But reflecting your honor and dignity, you must never become heedless and complacent by taking the shower of gifts, because they will then turn into Sukgaro Bodhisanghandi, gifts and offerings that kill the unworthy, as the bait kills the fish. The fourth instruction, Yilana Pezadza, this refers to medicine for the remedy of illness, which afflict both bhikkhus and lay people alike when the conditions arise. You must know and exercise moderation in requesting assistance from relatives or those supporters who volunteer their service. You must keep your requests well within the bounds of propriety. Knowing moderation is the necessary tamma which one who has gone forth should always bear in mind. You will then become a sankasobhana, a graceful recluse who adorns the sasana with elegance and beauty and is one who is well received by fellow Buddhists and the public at large. 
The important point which a bhikkhu must take into consideration is to be cautious and wary of excessiveness and immoderation in dealing with every form of solicitation, with the exception of going on brindabada, which is the daily observance practiced by bhikkhus and novices. You should never make a habit of visiting and soliciting cooperation from the lay people, and always exercise moderation when dealing with any necessary situation. After having heard the instruction on these fundamental tammas from the Lord Buddha, the Savakas gladly took them up and practiced them with zealous devotion by going into the seclusion and solitude of the forests and mountains, unimpeded by concern for their lives and well-being. Though they might have come from varying family backgrounds, some were kings or princes, they would not insist upon maintaining their past status or position. That would merely give rise to conceit, snobbery, and contempt for those requisites of living, food, and lodging that the lay supporters provided according to their means and resources. The Zavakas welcomed every kind of food, with the exception of those prohibited by the Vinaya, the monastic code of discipline, for the sake of maintaining their life process and supporting a consistent effort in their practice. They were mindful of their exertion, as well as their practical duties and observances. They were attracted to quiet and secluded surroundings, away from the noise and confusion of the world's disturbing influences. Their efforts in meditation steadily continued both day and night and in all postures, standing, walking, sitting, and lying down. To them, nothing was more worthwhile and rewarding than the practice that would rid them of dukkha. The Zavakas considered freedom from dukkha to be an invaluable tamma, more beneficial than the repeated births and deaths resulting from the deception of avidā, ignorance the source that causes all sentient beings to ceaselessly suffer dukkha. As the Zavakas were totally determined and dedicated to liberation, neither pride of royal blood and family wealth, nor pride of being a scholar or a learned person, could creep into their hearts. For them there was only the devotion to the practice of meditation, the means to lift the jitta out of dukkha. For this reason, all of them, from the first to the last Arahant Savaka, were able to gain enlightenment following the Lord Buddha. Therefore, may all of you practitioners turn your attention to the stories of the Lord Buddha and the Arahant Savakas and contemplate how they practiced in order to arrive at satisfactory results, how they became famous and were revered and venerated by all living beings, Devada or deities from every realm, and people from all walks of life. No one can surpass the Lord Buddha, the Tamma, and the Sangha in wisdom, discernment, and accomplishment, for in all of this they were supreme. All of us should reflect upon this. Being easily discouraged and weakened, or being obsessed with food and sleep, are not the way to true nobility and freedom from Dukkha. They are incapable of making the supreme Tamma appear within the field of our awareness, which is the heart. In every movement and posture, standing, walking, sitting, and lying down, you should always give heed to reason and constantly be observant of your actions. You should make sure that those actions don't delay your progress or blemish your body, speech, and heart. You should delight in seclusion and solitary existence and totally commit your effort, both in body and in heart, solely to the work of meditation. You should have dogged determination as your guide, with every thought and movement pointing toward the goal freedom from Dukkha. Then the outcome will undoubtedly be the same as that of the Lord Buddha and the Savakas, since it follows the same path. The Lord Buddha did not expound the Tamma teachings, for example, Samma Dirti, right view, and Samma Sankapo, right thought, for just anybody, but specifically for all of us who practice the way of Sila, Samati, and Banya, morality, calm and stability of heart, and wisdom. Once we have trod the path pointed out to us by the Lord and practiced following the fundamental instruction discussed in the foregoing paragraphs, for example, Rokkamula Seinasanang, living at the foot of trees, the result can only be freedom from Dukkha and the attainment to the natural eminence of a Buddha Savaka, the Buddha's noble disciple, which is the state of purity within one's heart. You must always be mindful, whether you are standing, walking, sitting, or lying down excepting only when you are asleep and it is beyond your means. Be always inclined to the application of satipanya, mindfulness and wisdom, and strenuous effort. 
the reality of deliverance will then appear within your heart. During the Lord Buddha's time, people listened to Tamma with sincere interest, fixing the Tamma they heard within their minds. They did not allow the Tamma to disperse and slip away, neither did they listen for courtesy's sake, doing it merely as a ritual. Everything that people today do, which includes all the bhikkhus here, becomes mere ritual. If you are not really dedicated and firmly determined for freedom from dukkha, everything you do will unconsciously turn into ritual. For instance, it would be a mere ritual if we walk jangama, walking meditation, just to keep up with the schedule we have set. Whether the jitta and sati are in tune with our exertion is a matter of debate, so consequently the forthcoming results will be different from what we expected. And for what reason? Even though we may be walking jangama, the jitta is focusing on everything except the tamma principle. What is the principle of tamma? The tamma principle is constant mindfulness while striving in your practice. When we are focusing our attention to investigate any particular theme or condition of tamma, if instead of being concentrated in those objects the jitta and sati are allowed to drift and wander to other places in Dharamana, drawn by their alluring and seductive powers, an indication that the flow of the heart has already gone astray, then the ensuing results must be contrary to tamma. This is what happens when we don't strive to observe our minds, but merely do the practice for its own sake. We might then think wrongly and criticize the sasana, decrying the tamma teaching of the Lord Buddha as not being the niyanika tamma that is truly capable of leading the practitioners of tamma away from dukkha. We might blame it for not being equal to the claim that it is the slakata tamma, the well-taught tamma. In truth, the flow of our heart is constantly pulling toward the world both day and night. So please bear in mind that the world, both internal and external, is different from the tamma aspired to by the Lord Buddha. The endeavor of the Lord Buddha and all the sabakas aimed for the tamma principle as the deliverance from dukkha. Consequently, all of their efforts were directed toward eradicating defilements until they were totally removed. Then they attained to the state of Buddha, illumination, which the whole world paid homage to. They had attained the consummation of tamma because their practices completely accorded with tamma. Such is the outcome when the means and ends fall together in complete harmony. But with us, though we may really be walking jangama or sitting in samadhi meditation, our samadhi is merely a stump-like samadhi. This is when we actually fall asleep right in samadhi practice. We tend to do this often, and some people may do it regularly, although I cannot confirm it. But it is probably the case, since the results always turn out so differently from the Lord Buddha. If the causes accord with Tamma, the results cannot be otherwise. Both the means and end result must correspond. So if we don't get the right results, it must be because we don't practice following the principle of Tamma. Instead of walking jangama or sitting in samadhi with sati in tune with the Tamma theme or the Sapawa Tamma process under investigation, the jitta turns to something else by sending the flow of the heart out, chasing after forms, sounds, smells, tastes, and tactile objects. Furthermore, the tammaramana, mental objects, conceived right in the heart, are also about forms, sounds, smells, tastes, and tactile objects, either those of the past or of the future. The jitta never stays in the present for even a single moment. If this is the case, the results must always be mundane, since the flow of the jitta is constantly involved with worldly affairs. The jitta, on the other hand, will also be mundane, being samudaya, the origin of dukkha that afflicts our heart with trouble and hardship. As a consequence, we find fault with the result. Why is there anxiety and worry? Why am I miserable today? We never take into consideration or realize that we perpetually instigate those unpleasant experiences by running at cross-purposes with tamma. That's why the outcome has to be like it is. For this reason, all of us who practice must constantly fix within our minds the resolution to be free from dukkha. We must never allow our actions done through body, speech, and heart to deviate from the teaching of the Lord Buddha who taught us to seek seclusion and solitude in the deep that are so conducive to our efforts. 
Never did he exhort anyone to live and practice in the market, or at the crossroads, or in crowded places packed with people, as if such places would instantly enable us to arrive at a safe haven free from Dukkha. We must contemplate on what Rukkamula Sainasanang, living under trees, really means. Every facet of the Thamma teaching expounded by all the Buddhas is backed up by sound and justifiable reasons. It is the basis of truth that will always impart benefits to those who observe and practice it. Therefore, the story of the Lord Buddha and the Savakas is a story of wonder and marvel in respect to how they cultivated the way and attained the ultimate achievement, becoming great teachers for the whole world. Whether he is a great teacher of the world, or an ordinary one, he can only teach us on some occasions. It is of paramount importance for us to take the Tamma, the principle of truth and reason which is the real essence of the great teacher, as the teacher who will constantly teach us. Then every action will always be made known to our teacher, which is our own heart. We must always bear this in mind and not be careless or absent-minded. Otherwise, we will never be able to keep to our course and survive, but instead will waste our time uselessly. Don't ever entertain the thought that day and night, either of the past, present, or future, are something exceptional or unusual, for they are all the self-same day and night. The gilesas and the asavas that are involved with the heart and all its related conditions are not dependent on time. This is the most significant fact. Please investigate it. Wherever you go, you should always have the great teacher guiding you. Whether you are sitting or lying down, standing or walking, you should always be mindful of your deportment. Without the basis of Sati and Banya, calm of heart and circumspection cannot arise. This is because Sati Banya and your diligent effort form a protective fence to safeguard them. All that is required is for you to keep within the bounds of Sila, Samadhi and Banya as you tread the path with your strenuous exertion. You will then experience the realm free from Dukkha right within your own heart without having to ask anyone else about it. Regardless of time, if the Svaka Tathamma is still extant in the world, and the one who listens takes it up for study and practices following its instruction with dedication, the result can only be the attainment of freedom from Dukkha. This you will clearly perceive in your heart. Please keep this in mind and correct the problem in your heart or else your practice will steadily degenerate and you will never be able to accomplish anything. When you are always mindful and constantly probe with banya into the sabhava tammas, the body for example, you will constantly come across unusual and extraordinary knowledge. On the other hand, if your efforts are spasmodic, then the forthcoming result will be correspondingly limited. So you should try to cultivate and develop sati and banya to be constantly mindful and circumspect. This will definitely contribute to samadhi, firmness and stability of heart, and genuine wisdom in the way of banya which arises due to the investigation of the body, vedana, zitta, and tamma, or the investigation of the four aryasatta, noble truths, of dukkha, samudaya, rota, and magga. Please also understand that the satipatthana and the aryasatta are the tammas of the present, which are constantly exhibiting themselves right within your body and heart. In the Madsima Bhadibhada, the middle way of practice, i.e. the Noble Eightfold Path, the Lord expounded Samadhirti, right view. This means right view of things in general, of specific things, or of the subtle aspect of Tamma. The right views of the average Buddhist deal specifically with the belief in vice and virtue, that those who practice virtue reap the fruits of virtue, and those who practice evil reap the fruits of evil, and so on. They have the conviction that these things truly exist. This is one level of Samadhirti. The specific understanding of the practitioner who investigates the four Satipatthana, or the four Aryasatta, with Banya is another level of Samadhirti. Here you contemplate the body, Vedana, Zitta, and Tamma, to see them as the De Lakana, three characteristics of existence, that they are all intrinsically Anitta, Dukkha, and Anatta, impermanent suffering and not self. You build up your faith and firm conviction in the Satsa Tamma by investigating the De Lakkana and by taking the De Lakkana inherent within the Sabhava Tammas as the path for Banya to follow. Moreover, you investigate the Arya Satsa to perceive and realize that Dukkha, which arises from the body and heart of oneself and all other beings, is something that one cannot remain heedless and complacent about. You also see the harm of Samudaya the source that generates the Dukkha that all creatures must suffer endlessly. 
Consequently, you are ready to dismantle and eradicate Samudaya with Banya, so that you may arrive at Nirodha, the realm of the total cessation of Dukkha. Samadirti, as right view of the subtle aspects of Tamma, deals with the correct understanding of Dukkha as one form of truth, of Samudaya as another, of Nirodha as another, and of Magga, Sila, Samati, and Banya as another form of truth. This is the correct view that neither voices opinion nor passes judgment on the Arya Satcha and all the Sapawa Tammas everywhere. This is another level of Samadirti. Since there are practitioners with various Tamma attainments, there are many levels of Samadirti. If there was only one level of Samadirti, Banya could not be of many grades. Since there are several degrees of Gilesas, producers of sadness and gloom, Banya must correspondingly be of many grades. For this reason, Samadirti is also of many levels. The second path factor is Samazangabo, right thought. It is of three categories, the thought of non-oppression, the thought of friendliness free from ill will, and the thought that frees one of entanglement and bonds. The thought of non-oppression refers to regard for the welfare of our fellow beings, both people and animals alike. We must also pay attention to our own well-being by not taxing and overburdening ourselves. We do not meditate on how to intentionally inflict troubles and hardships on others, nor do we contemplate ways we can bring degeneracy and moral torpitude upon ourselves by, for instance, indulging in alcohol and narcotic drugs like opium and heroin. The thought of friendship means to refrain from feeling animosity or aversion for people and animals. We do not contemplate tyrannizing and trampling on others, nor do we maliciously wish others to suffer illness or fall dead nor do we contemplate suicide by the various methods that are regularly reported in the newspapers. Those thoughts arise due to wrong reflection. Where previously a person's life was his most valuable possession, due to wrong understanding it now becomes his enemy. This kind of story happens all the time. You should understand that this is the outcome of wrong thoughts and faulty reasoning. Someone who truly safeguards and looks after himself will immediately curb and restrain any wrong thoughts as soon as the jitta begins to conceive them within the heart by relinquishing and abandoning them. How could he allow those wrong reflections to get out of hand to the point of committing suicide? Is this an example of loving oneself? One kind of thought of renunciation is to think in a way that releases us from entanglements in the mundane manner that people usually consider. For instance, thinking of delivering ourselves from the bonds of poverty, want, and hunger in order to achieve wealth and abundance. Another form of renunciation is the practice of dana, sila, and palana, generosity, morality, and mind development. Here we think about contributing to the construction of roads, wells, and jedias, pagodas, maintaining and refurbishing old, dilapidated sacred shrines and relics, or building gutis and biharas, bhikkhus dwelling, Zala, assembly pavilions, and other kinds of structures for the sake of merit and virtue, so that we can lift ourselves from the mass of Dukkha. Another kind of contemplation is to contemplate and see the peril in birth, old age, sickness, and death, that are inherent within every form of sentient existence without exception, and to discern that the life of one who has gone forth is conducive to the development of the way of Zila, Samadhi, and Banya the way that fulfills our aspirations, and to make up our mind to take the going forth to become a nun, a bhikkhu, or a novice. A practitioner contemplates and investigates his subject of meditation to release the jitta from all mental hindrances. He utilizes all the various methods, developed by perpetual analysis and reflection, to eradicate the gilesas. He steadily removes the gilesas through the various stages right up to the automatic level of samas and kapo. By constantly probing and examining, he finally eliminates all the gilesas. This is the last category of Samazangabo, and the end of the elaboration of this second path factor. The Lord taught us the third path factor, Samavata, right speech. This includes speaking about things in general, but more specifically about a dialogue on Tamma. Speaking words of wisdom that are not detrimental to those who listen, speaking with reason that is impressive and eloquent, speaking politely, modestly, and unassumingly, and speaking in gratitude and appreciation of all people who have been kind and benevolent, are all one level of samavata. The most appropriate form of speech is talk about tamma. This means speaking only about the saleka, purifying tammas, the means of removing the kilesas. This includes talk of wanting little in terms of a bhikkhu's basic requisites, talk of being contented with whatever requisites are made available in accordance with tamma, talk of not socializing and mingling with others, 
talk of seclusion and quietude of body and heart, talk of strenuous exertion and diligent effort, talk of maintaining the purity of sila, moral precepts, talk of the development of samadhi, talk of the cultivation of banya to sharpen the power of discernment, talk of vimutti, the state of deliverance, and of vimutti jnana dasana, the clear penetrative realization of deliverance. These are the subtle aspects of samadhata. They are not vain talk or gossip, but serious talk full of interest, appreciation, and devotion to the effort needed to apply these purifying tammas. The Lord taught us the fourth path factor, Sammagamanto, right action or pursuit. There are right actions that deal with general mundane work and those that deal with the work of tamma. Occupations that are not against the law, for example, farming and trading, fall within the bounds of right pursuit. The building of temples and monasteries, with the practices of dana and sila, and the development of metta pavana, loving kindness, are another kind of right pursuit. The practices of walking jangama and sitting in samadhi are also another variety of right undertaking. Every movement of body, speech, and mind is gamma, action. Therefore, actions done by body, speech, and heart are called gamma. Correct and proper bodily actions, speech, and thoughts are called samma gammanta. Right pursuit carries a wide and extensive meaning, so it's up to each individual to interpret and apply it for himself. The world and tamma have always been paired together like the left and right arms of the same person. It is not possible to separate the world and tamma. The world has its work and tamma has its. Since the condition and the makeup of people vary from case to case, their undertakings cannot be identical. For this reason, a lay person must pursue the work that befits his position, while someone who follows the way of Tamma must pursue the work of one who has gone forth. Each must take up the work that accords with his status. In either case, don't allow your pursuits in life to conflict with what is right. Each one will then have his own Sammagamanda, right undertaking. Both the world and Tamma will steadily flourish with each passing day, because everyone is contributing and helping. The Lord taught us the fifth path factor. Samma adjivo, right livelihood. This includes feeding ourselves, which is the common form of livelihood among people and animals. Nourishing the jitta with wholesome aramana, mental objects, is another kind of livelihood. Nurturing the jitta with the higher levels of tamma is another. A legitimate way of living in accordance with tamma, not unlawful ones like theft and corruption, is one form of samma adjivo. We live off of what we can obtain to support our lives from day to day. If we are able to acquire things in abundance in a way that accords with tamma, that is also an aspect of samma adivo. The nourishment of the heart with aramana, mental objects, that arise due to its contact with external objects, like forms of men and women, their sounds, their smells, their tastes, and male and female body contacts, is another variety of samma adivo. This includes anything that suits our liking and keeps us happy and cheerful, free from sadness and melancholy. We are constantly absorbed in pleasure and delight, which serves as the elixir of life. But should we pursue them in the wrong way, they could turn into poisons destroying the heart. This type of samma adzivo is suitable to those in the world who know the right measure of things, as well as propriety, bounds, and limits in behavior. Preventing the poisons of the world from affecting the eyes, ears, nose, tongue, body, and heart is the way of nurturing the heart with tamma. Every contact made with forms, sounds, smells, tastes, tactile objects, and mental objects should always be contemplated in the light of tamma. We should not allow any affection or aversion to arise, for it will be a discomfort for the heart. The investigation that accords with tamma will provide and sustain the heart with the essence of tamma. The heart will experience bliss, contentment, and serenity. It will be permeated with wisdom and discernment, so we won't seek any aramana that is poisonous and destructive to the heart, but only those that constantly provide and nourish the heart with tamma. We must always investigate in the light of tamma every contact between the internal ayatanas, sense organs, like the eyes and ears, and the external ayatanas, sense objects like sights and sounds, for true understanding and liberation. We must never contemplate in the worldly-minded way, as it is the way of taking in fire to burn ourselves. This will only cause anxiety and restlessness inside the heart. We must constantly feed the heart with the aramana of tamma. The essence of tamma is the nourishment of the heart. It will steadily sustain and protect the heart, keeping it secure. The Lord taught us the sixth path factor, samma right effort. 
There are four kinds of effort. The effort to prevent the accumulation of unwholesome qualities within our character. The effort to get rid of anything unwholesome that has arisen. The effort to develop wholesome qualities within us. And the effort to maintain the wholesome qualities that have already arisen. We must make them all benaiko, drawing inward by applying them to our own level of attainment and tamma, where they will be drawn into the basic principles of samadhi and banya. We must devote ourselves to taking care of the jitta that is obsessed and infatuated with the flow of danha, craving, due to the power of ignorance dragging it away. We must try to curb the restlessness and disquiet of the jitta with the disciplinary power of sati and banya. The way of sila samati and banya is the tamma that can rectify every kind of kilesa, so we must strive to develop them within our hearts. If we aspire for nibbana and the total extinction of the fire of anxiety, we must carefully cultivate sila samati and banya. Once the levels of sila samati and banya have appeared within us, we must not let them slip away through negligence. One must nourish and develop them to full maturity, where they will be developed into the magganyarna, supramundane knowledge of the path that can obliterate all traces of the kilesas. The realm of vimutti, freedom, and nibbana that was previously perceived as something beyond our means and abilities will be the tamma realized within our hearts the instant all the kilesas have been eliminated. The Lord taught us the seventh path factor, sammasati, right mindfulness. This is the setting up of mindfulness in our meditation practice. Whatever tamma we use as the heart's aramana, for example, the recollection of butto or anabana sati, mindfulness of breathing, we should have sati concentrating on that object. Or if we should focus our attention on the four objects of sati pratana, body, vedana, citta, and tamma, whether for the development of samadhi or in the investigation for the development of banya, we must constantly have sati attending to every moment of our meditation. This is one category of samasati, right mindfulness. The Lord taught us the eighth path factor, samasamati, right calm and concentration. This refers to the samati that is imbued with banya and not the stump-like samati. It is also not the type of samati that is constantly addictive, where we have no inclination to investigate in the way of banya because we think that this type of samati is in itself an adequately exalted tamma. Instead, we criticize banya as being unworthy. This kind of samati is called mitta, incorrect samati and it is not the samadhi that can truly deliver us from dukkha. To practice the samadhi that will free us from dukkha, we must focus our attention on any particular tamma principle or theme that we prefer, having sati directing and guarding until the jitta manages to converge into samadhi. It doesn't matter what class of samadhi this may be. It is right samadhi as long as we feel that the jitta has become calm and ceased thinking, remaining in singularity and isolation from all surrounding conditions for a time, before withdrawing from that state. This is different from the samadhi in which the jitta converges and you immediately lose track of day and night and become totally ignorant of whether you're still alive or not. It's as though you're dead. Only after the jitta has withdrawn do you realize that it entered into calm and wandered away into the blue. This is the stump-like samadhi because it resembles a tree stump without any consciousness. Try to avoid this type of samadhi. If you have already grown used to it, you must immediately change and remedy it. This sort of samadhi is found in the circle of those who practice. The way to cure it is to avoid allowing the chitta to converge as it usually does. If you allow it to, it will always stick to that habit. Instead, you must force the chitta to take a tour of the body with sati firmly in control, going up and down, over and over again, until panya, magga, and pala, wisdom, path, and fruit, are realized. The kind of samadhi that is samasamadhi is the one that has sati attending to the state of calm once the jitta has converged into samadhi. After the jitta has come out of samadhi, you should investigate in the way of banya the various sabhavatamas that are found within the body and jitta. You should investigate when it is opportune and appropriate to do so. Samadhi and banya are the tamas that are always interrelated. You shouldn't let your samadhi drift away because of not paying careful attention to it. In short, these three tammas, sati, samadhi, and banya, are interrelated and inseparable. Samadhi and banya take turns doing the work while sati watches over them. The above eight path factors have been discussed partly from principles of tamma and partly from practical experience. Please note that the tammas from samadhirti, right view, through to samasamati, are tammas comprised of many levels. 
It's up to each individual to take them and apply them in his practice in accordance with his thamma attainment and ability. Regardless of whether you are a lay person or a bhikkhu, if you are interested, you can practice for the full development of these eight path factors. The fruits of vimutti, freedom, and vimutti jnana dasana, knowledge and insight of freedom, will then be your most valuable possession. This is because sila, samadhi, and manya are all found within that magga, path. They are like the keys that will open and clearly reveal these two vimuttis to the heart. Moreover, all of you who practice should not understand that vimutti and vimutti jnana dasana are separate from each other or that they perform two different functions. Truly, that's not the case. When a man chops wood with an axe, as soon as the wood is cut up, he both sees it with his eyes and at the same instant realizes it in his heart. In the same way, vimutti and vimutti jnana dasana will make you both perceive and experience simultaneously the detachment of the kilesas from the heart, which is accomplished by way of sila, samadhi, and banya. Thereafter, there can be no more fussing with problems, because all the bothersome issues arise from the conflict between the heart and the kilesas. This is the greatest of all issues in the three realms of existence. Once the heart, which is the primary problem, is let go, the gilesas which reside in and live off the heart will naturally fall away. Furthermore, sila, samadhi, banya, vimutti, and vimutti, jnana, dasana all remain as they truly are. They are all real, so consequently, all the contentious issues come to an end. Today I have presented a talk on Tamma to you who practice by highlighting the example of the Lord Buddha and the Savakas, so that it may serve as a guide pointing out the correct way to you. Now you can set your compass, your mode of practice, and relentlessly strive to follow the path of the Lord Buddha. Once you have fully developed the tammas of Sila, Samadhi, and Banya, then Vimutti and Vimutti Jnana Dasana, the essence of Nibbana, will undoubtedly be your possession. For this reason, may all of you set up the understanding that all the aforementioned tammas are found right within your body and your heart. Please draw them inward to be your own possession. Then, both the cultivation of the means of practice and its fruits of imutti and nibbana that I have illustrated will all belong to you, either today or sometime in the future. Evan. Such is the way.